In Kern County, there are many murders each year. But the murder of Yvette Pena in a Bakersfield motel caught the public's eye and became especially infamous. This tragic event occurred in 2011 and was shocking in its brutality. What made this case even more remarkable was the individual who confessed to the crime, a merciless man covered in tattoos. His chilling demeanor and the gruesome details of the murder captivated and horrified the community. Born on March 7, 1988, in Bakersfield, California, Jaime Osuna's early life unfolded in a tumultuous manner. His mother, Michelle, was just 19 years old at the time, while little is known about his father except that he was 21, rebellious and undisciplined. Jaime's father displayed abusive tendencies toward Michelle from the start, even resorting to kicking her in the stomach while she was pregnant with Jaime. This cruel act left lasting harm on Jaime, even before he took his first breath. Some speculate that this incident may have contributed to Jaime's ear malformation and potentially impacted his brain development. Recognizing the abusive nature of her husband, Michelle made the courageous decision to divorce him. Soon afterward, she met Jeff, a man with whom she felt an instant connection and it appeared that Jeff would step into the role of Jamie's new stepfather. Jamie's biological father, however, strongly opposed this development. Despite Michelle's desire to sever ties with him, he persisted in causing trouble. One fateful night, he threatened Jeff by holding a knife to his throat. Thankfully, the situation didn't escalate further. He was apprehended and a restraining order was issued. This marks the last mention of Jamie's biological father in his story. Shortly thereafter, Michelle married Jeff, and they began cohabiting with Jamie and his brother, who was two years Jamie's senior. This is where the story takes a dark and troubling turn. While Jeff desired Michelle, he seemed less enthusiastic about assuming the role of a stepfather. Regrettably, this resulted in a period of misery for Jaime, while his older brother was somewhat spared, having gone to live with their grandparents once they became aware of Jeff's abusive behavior. It remains unclear why Jamie wasn't also taken in by his grandparents, but it seems that they declined to care for him, leaving one to wonder why they would reject a three-year-old child. It's important to note that Michelle also made the choice to prioritize her relationship with Jeff over the well-being of her two young sons. Jeff's abusive actions were well documented through accounts from Michelle, Jaime, and records from hospitals and law enforcement agencies. On one occasion, during a road trip with Michelle and Jaime secured in a baby carrier in the back seat, Jaime's crying provoked Jeff to a point where he began shouting at the child. Shockingly, he then threw the baby carrier out of the moving car. Fortunately, the baby carrier landed safely and Jamie displayed no visible injuries. However, subsequent examinations revealed severe brain damage that could have resulted from this traumatic incident. Around the age of five, another distressing incident marred Jamie's already tumultuous childhood. He accidentally spilled some juice on the floor, which infuriated Jeff. In a fit of anger, Jeff grabbed a belt and began to mercilessly beat the young boy. This time, Michelle intervened by calling the police. Jeff was subsequently arrested on charges of child cruelty due to the visible marks on Jamie's body. However, the charges were relatively lenient and, disconcertingly, Jeff returned home just 10 days later, with Michelle still standing by his side. Even after they had their own children, Jeff continued to mistreat Jamie, depriving him of proper meals and sometimes serving his food on the floor. Jaime increasingly felt like an outsider in his own home. Michelle, 
though aware of her past mistakes, found herself unable to rectify the deep-seated damage that had been done. At the age of 12, Jaime finally managed to escape the clutches of his abusive household and went to live with his grandparents. Everyone had come to realize that Jeff's mistreatment of Jaime would not cease. It was during this time that they began to notice the emotional numbness that had gripped Jaime from a tender age. Michelle described it as if his soul had been torn away, leaving him apathetic towards everything and everyone around him. This period marked the onset of Jaime's disturbing behavior. He began cooking animals in a nearby forest, and in the absence of anyone at home, subjected his own pet cat to chilling ordeals, locking it in the refrigerator and even the oven. He also turned to self-harm, as it seemed to be the only way for him to feel something, anything, in a world where he felt utterly numb. At the age of 15, Jaime took a dire turn when he brutally stabbed another boy, leaving him gravely wounded but fortunate to survive the ordeal. This criminal act led to Jaime's incarceration in a juvenile correctional facility, where he would spend the next four years. It was during this period that Michelle finally confronted the gravity of her irresponsibility toward Jaime, resulting in her decision to divorce Jeff. A few years later, Jeff met his demise due to a heart attack. Given his abusive history, it's conceivable that Jaime might have inflicted harm upon him if he had not passed away. On September 14, 2007, Jaime was released from prison at the age of 19. By this time, he had acquired a notorious reputation as a troublemaker, deeply entrenched in gang activities. He showed little interest in education or gainful employment, instead opting for a lifestyle characterized by revelry and association with his gang affiliates. The turning point in this harrowing narrative occurred in December 2008 when a 16-year-old boy's birthday party took a rather unexpected turn. This was no typical birthday celebration adorned with Mickey Mouse piñatas and cheerful decorations. Instead, it drew a crowd from the gritty underbelly of society, and the absence of any responsible adult to maintain order was notable. This unconventional gathering had been organized by the birthday boy's mother, who was known for her laissez-faire attitude. Joelle Castellano, a 37-year-old single mother of three, played a central role in this intriguing tale. She decided to host a party for underage youths, which, while undoubtedly irresponsible, didn't spell the end of the world. As the evening progressed, however, Things took a turn for the chaotic, with Joelle's dance with a young man catching the eye of her nephew. It seemed that this young relative became envious, possibly due to his own romantic feelings for his aunt, leading him to want to keep others away from her. In his quest to intimidate the young man, Joelle pointed to Jaime, who, despite not yet having the distinctive facial tattoos he would later acquire, stood at around five Three. However, it was Jaime's demeanor and attitude that made him an intimidating presence, perhaps more so than anyone else in the room. Jaime agreed to confront the young man, proceeding to the kitchen, where he retrieved a knife and warned the boy to steer clear of Joel. The young man, believing that Jaime wouldn't actually follow through, issued a challenge. However, Jaime defied expectations and indeed stabbed the young man, leading to his return to prison. But something had changed this time. Jaime couldn't shake one thought from his mind. He had fallen head over heels in love with Joel. It wasn't just because of the recent stabbing incident, but a genuine and profound love. As they say, love can compel us to commit acts beyond imagination. Jaime no longer cared about his circumstances. He believed he could win over Joel, despite their age gap, his imprisonment, and their initial encounter involving a stabbing. Jaime began sending heartfelt love letters to Joel, and eventually, she too succumbed to his affections. Thus, they embarked on a long-distance relationship. Eleven months later, when Jamie completed his sentence, Joel picked him up in her truck. 
However, her confidence wavered upon seeing that Yami had acquired facial tattoos, raising doubts about the seriousness of their relationship. Despite all the waiting, Yami's eagerness prevailed as he suggested to Joel that they spend the night in a motel. Joelku agreed, albeit under the impression that it would be a one-night affair, yet Jaime, known as the sharpshooter, proved remarkably effective as that single night led to Joel becoming pregnant. With this development, she felt increasingly inclined to establish a lasting relationship with him. A mere three months later, they sealed their commitment in marriage. Jaime made solemn promises to Joel, assuring her that he understood the hardships of growing up in a fractured family and vowing to be a devoted father and husband. However, even before their child came into the picture, he exhibited abusive behavior towards Joel. It's at this point in the story that he began to adopt characteristics reminiscent of the Joker, not to sensationalize the narrative, but because there is a noticeable parallel. His abuse towards Joel wasn't solely physical. It had a strong psychological element, perhaps driven by the belief that this form of harm could be even more devastating. An example of this occurred during one heated argument when things spiraled out of control. Jaime seized the ashes of Joel's deceased mother from a vase and fled with them. He was keenly aware that Joel had not yet come to terms with her mother's passing, and this act prompted her to call the police. Jaime was arrested, but the ashes were never recovered. This unfortunate incident resulted in Jaime being sent back to prison, causing him to miss the birth of his child. Upon his release, Joel granted him another chance, hoping that, with the child's arrival, Jaime would take on the role of a responsible father. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a futile endeavor. Shortly thereafter, Jaime shifted his focus from physical harm to inflicting emotional distress on Joel. She did something that greatly disturbed individuals like him who craved attention. She ignored him completely. Regardless of what he said or did, it no longer affected her. One day, in an attempt to provoke a reaction from Joel, Jaime pushed her seven-year-old son off the bed, all while keeping his gaze fixed on her. His tactics proved successful. She became visibly upset and fetched a knife from the kitchen. In a stern tone, she warned him, mess with me, but never with my kids. At that moment, Jaime's face betrayed his surprise and fear. He hadn't anticipated such a response. Frightened, he reached out to his gang to extricate him from the situation. While outside the house, Jaime turned to methamphetamines, which explains his current aged appearance, making him resemble a 60-year-old man. Now that he no longer officially resided with Joel, he commenced stalking her from outside her home. Joel called the police, leading to Jamie's arrest and a seven-month prison sentence for violating his parole. However, within a week of his release, he resumed his harassment of Joel. She would spot him outside her window, his gaze unwavering, and he would make menacing phone calls, threatening her and her children. Joel contacted the police once again, but upon their arrival, they failed to locate Yami. Days passed with no trace of him. Then, on November 8, 2011, Joel received a chilling call from Jamie, in which he uttered the sinister words, Check the news. I just killed a woman at the Morocco Motel. Naturally, Joel's immediate response was to contact the police. However, they didn't take her seriously. What transpired next is where the story takes an eerie turn, as it was five days after this call that a motel employee discovered a gruesome crime scene in one of the motel's rooms. The victim was a 37-year-old woman named Yvette, a mother of six. Details are scarce, but it appears to have been an exceedingly horrific crime scene. Investigators, who deemed it one of the most disturbing cases in their careers, found evidence of two knives and scissors used in the slow and torturous manner of death. Jaime, it seemed, harbored a sadistic streak. You might wonder how I have access to these gruesome details. Well, 
This wouldn't be his solitary murder, nor the most heinous. Even more chilling is the absence of any apparent motive for targeting this woman, strongly suggesting that she became a victim solely because of her resemblance to Joel. Jaime would ultimately face arrest, trial, and sentencing for this horrifying murder. While incarcerated, Jaime took disturbing actions to further torment Joel. He would occasionally contact Child Protective Services in an attempt to have her custody of her children revoked, knowing that this would inflict the most pain on her. He even went to the extent of trying to hire a hitman to eliminate her. However, because he communicated these intentions through letters, the police intercepted them before they could reach their intended recipient. These actions only added layers to the mask he wore, a facade he maintained to feel something, a desperate attempt to fill the void he had experienced as a child. The trial for the murder of Yvette dragged on for five years, during which Jamie displayed no remorse whenever he appeared in court. He would even wave and laugh at the victim's family. This extended trial was a result of Jamie's refusal to confess. It's worth noting that he managed to prolong the trial for more than half a decade by remaining silent. However, on March 24, 2017, just three days before the final trial, where the verdict was still uncertain, a news channel offered him an interview. They aimed to capitalize on his striking appearance to generate clicks and had planned to ask him challenging questions to elicit a confession. To everyone's astonishment, they didn't need to ask any questions because Shamey confessed to the murder of Yvette right at the start of the interview. It's evident that he did this to gain notoriety as there is no doubt that he deliberately presented himself as a villain in the news. What corroborates this is his confession to two more murders, one at the age of 13 and the other at 19. The police initiated a search for the supposed victims based on Jamie's descriptions since he hadn't provided any names. Given that he had spent his entire life in Bakersfield, the margin for error was minimal However, the database did not yield any records of missing persons or unsolved murders that could be attributed to him. Therefore, it's highly likely that these claims are exaggerated. With all these confessions, Hami was undoubtedly found guilty three days later. However, he did not receive the death penalty because of his confession on the day of the trial, which had caused a five-year delay and wasted time and resources. Still, what remains perplexing to everyone is what happened next. Upon entering prison, he exhibited increasingly erratic behavior. He painted the walls of his cell with his own blood. On one fateful evening, he was placed in a cell with a man he harbored animosity towards, and he mercilessly stabbed him multiple times using a knife. He even inflicted a deep facial wound, requiring the victim to undergo 67 stitches. Jaime went so far as to request photographs of his victims as trophies, further underscoring the disturbing nature of his actions. He had earned a reputation as an inmate too dangerous to share a cell with anyone, but in a bewildering and illogical turn of events in March 2019, Jaime found himself with his first-ever cellmate, a 44-year-old man named Luis Romero. In 1992, at the tender age of 17, Luis, originally from Guatemala, had joined a gang in the United States and had taken someone's life during a confrontation with rival gang members. He had been sentenced to 27 years in prison and was on the verge of completing his sentence. However, in a confounding and irrational twist of fate, he was assigned to the same cell as Jaime, who had committed a more gruesome crime. Jaime was well aware of the extent of his own actions, having just committed them, boasting a lengthy history of criminal deeds. Moreover, he had been denied cellmates in the past because of the perceived danger he posed. Luis was merely three weeks away from regaining his freedom. In less than 24 hours since they had become cellmates, on the morning of March 9, 2019, when correctional officers came to inspect their cell, they stumbled upon an eerie sight. Jaime was smiling. 
wearing a collar. This collar was fashioned from various parts of Luis's body, and Jaime had gone as far as carving a grotesque, clown-like smile on Luis's face. He had toyed with his lifeless body, inscribed messages on the walls using blood, and declared, I am the man of a thousand faces. Now, the theories start to surface because it is evident that such an atrocity would require more than a mere hour. It would take many hours to commit such unspeakable acts. A correctional officer responsible for conducting a nighttime check reported that everything was in order, even though Luis's body indicated that the gruesome assault had already begun at that hour. Some guards attempted to justify this oversight by claiming that Jaime had placed a blanket to conceal the ongoing horror. But if an inmate places a blanket to obscure events behind a cell door, it is incumbent upon the guard to enter and investigate. What transpired here was not an isolated incident at this prison. It occurred at a prison, which had gained notoriety due to allegations of guards organizing fights among inmates, all while placing bets on the outcomes. There exist videos of these fights, complete with a presenter and commentator. Furthermore, suspicions linger that this practice was employed when authorities sought to dispose of a troublesome inmate. They would orchestrate a fight, and when one participant was winning, they would shoot the other inmate, claiming they were intervening to save them. This case presents further complexity due to Jamie's clearly deteriorated mental state. It is evident that he harbors a fascination with the Joker, as evidenced by the blood-written phrases from the comics adorning his cell. It remains a mystery how he managed to procure razors to make knives, and his letter to a prosecutor inspired by the Joker and featuring the iconic why so serious phrase raises questions. The letter also contains satanic messages, although it's doubtful he genuinely adheres to Satanism. These actions are likely undertaken for attention-seeking purposes. He received a diagnosis of an unknown form of schizophrenia within the spectrum, alongside antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, characterized by erratic behavior, which could explain his propensity to stab others without a clear provocation, and post-traumatic stress disorder. As a result, authorities declared him unfit to stand trial. Consequently, at the age of 33, it appears improbable that Hamey will face the death penalty and he will likely spend the rest of his life behind bars. Jaime was undeniably unhinged, with a touch of clownishness. However, some might argue that he endured a troubled childhood. Nevertheless, the extremity of his actions remains unparalleled. Interestingly, his older brother, who sought refuge with their grandparents at a young age, has since transformed into a prosperous individual, a millionaire who enjoys driving sports cars and has a loving family. You've just witnessed another unreal true crime. Lock in your support by subscribing and turning on notifications. Your insight could open the next story. Have a good day.